Mangwana ni mwalele po bugenja ni vanave Africa. Welcome to the show that keeps you abreast with the latest happenings from the continent and the entire world. My name is Aina Raiza Koyo alongside Diana Master Mamkase. Tamuka Mamkase. Tamuka. Monoshu Nureiri. Ah. <laughs> It's all fun and games until I go yeah, deeper, don't right? Go deeper, <laughs> how are you doing? I'm well, how are you? It's a quarter to weekend, Thursday. I'm excited. I'm also excited. Yeah, because. But before we get excited, let's mm. actually get into what you can expect <laughs> in today's broadcast in Sierra, in Sierra Leone the people fighting the sea to build a home. Nigeria's Bolati Nubu declared a winner of presidential vote. Militants kidnapped 25 young people in northern DR Congo. We'll be back with the top story right after this. Chill Sessions is an entertainment show that brings you the latest hit, fashion and entertainment news. If you would like to feature your brand or campaign on this platform, contact chill at synergy.com.na. Chill Sessions, bringing art and entertainment to the people. In Sierra Leone, people are fighting the sea to build a home. Off a path in Cockle Bay, a slum in Sierra Leone's capital, Freetown, lies a squatted tin roofed house where Lamrana Ba lives and works. The widow mother of six who sells soft drinks from her front porch build the home from the ground up, or more precisely, from the water up. Most of the houses were were constructed on land reclaimed from the sea in the process known as backing. Uh, residents pile layers of tires, rubbish and sack of earth into water, pack the ballast with mud and then build homes on top. It is a unique solution to Freetown's problem of overcrowding rooted in its geography and exacerbated excuse me, during a decade-long civil war. Banking uh, displays the resourcefulness of a community who with their own muscle and miagre saving battle the sea to make a place of their own. But their unauthorized homes also face perils ranging from, from floods to fire and struggle with lack of roads and basic services. Ba used to live in an ordinary apartment in the city, but after her husband died, she could no longer afford to rent. Moving over to Nigeria, Bola Tibu declared winner of presidential vote. Ruling party candidate Bola Tinubu was declared winner of Nigeria's presidential election early Wednesday and soon after thanked his supporters and appealed to his rivals who were already demanding a vote in Africa's most populous nation. The announcement by election officials overnight was likely to lead to a court challenge by the second and third highest finishers in the weekend vote, Atiku Abubaka and Peter Obi. Abubaka also finished second in the last vote in 2019, then appealed those results before his lawsuit ultimately was dismissed. Tinubu's ruling All Progressives Congress Party urged the opposition to accept defeat Tuesday and not to cause trouble after they had demanded a revote, saying that delays in uploading election results had made room for irregularities. Tinubu received 37% of the vote, or nearly 8.8 .8 million, while main opposition candidate Abu Bakr won 29% with almost 7 million. Third place finisher Obi took 25% with about 6.1 million, according to the results announced on live television by the Independent National Electoral Commission. 
In our next story, militants kidnapped 25 youth in northern DR Congo. Unidentified militants have kidnapped 25 young people in the Northern Democratic Republic of Congo, an administrative official said on Tuesday. During attacks on several villages in the region, gunmen raided three villages in the Banda area of Basulele province in the early hours of Tuesday morning, said Marceline Lekambusia, a local government administrator. Details about the attacks are hazy, but Lukambisia said the militants kidnapped 25 people aged between 12 and 18. Seven of those abducted were girls. In a telephone interview, the administrator also explained that the gunmen had released the adults they had captured. AFP was unable to confirm the account independently. Bada lies 180 kilometers from the border with the Central African Republic, a volatile country that remains scarred by the 2013 civil war. Now, South African scientists use bugs in war against hyacinth weed. The hot beer sport dam in South Africa used to be brimming with people enjoying scenic landscapes and recreational water sports. Now the visitors are greeted to the sign of boats stuck in the sea of invasive green water hyacinth weed. The spike in hard teeth as a hot beer sport is known can be attributed to pollution with sewage, industrial chemicals, heavy metals and litter flowing on rivers, in rivers rather from Johannesburg to Pretoria. In South Africa, we are faced with highly polluted waters, said Professor Julie Kutsia, who has studied water hyacinths for over 20 years and manages the Aquatic Seeds Program at the Center for Biological Control at Rhodes University. Nutrients in the pollutants act as perfect fertilizers for the weed, a big concern for nearby communities due to its devastating impact on livelihoods. Dion Mosted, 53, is on the verge of laying off 25 workers at his recreational boat company after his business came to a standstill because of the water because of the carpet of water hyacinths. The tiny flume feeding insects are the natural enemy to the plants. Both are originally from the Amazon basin in South America and are released by thousands at a time. The, in the insects destroy the weed by attacking tissue that transports nutrients produced in the leaves during photosynthesis to rest of the plant. The insect army has previously reduced the expanse of water hyacinths to a mere 5% on the dam, Katsia said. At times, the weed has covered at least 50% of it. Mali's new proposed constitution will boost the powers of a president. Proposed changes to Mali's constitutions would bolster the president power and reduce the status of the French language. That's according to a revised draft of the document, which was handed to the country's transitional president, Colonel Asimi Goita, on Monday. The proposed new constitution is a key element of a vast reformer project. It initiated to ensure a return to civil rule. Following an election, it says it will be held in February 2024. While it is yet to be officially published, a copy seen by the AFP news agency says that the head of state, not the government, will determine the policies of the nation. If approved, the president would also be responsible for appointing and firing the prime minister and government ministers and be empowered to dissolve the National Assembly. Proposing laws will be the prerogative of the president and the National Assembly, whereas this was previously the right of the government and MPs. And now bringing us to the end of our top stories, Uganda sets plans for new anti-gay law. Uganda will propose a new anti-gay bill on Wednesday, the Speaker of the country's parliament said, as conspiracy theories accusing shadowy international forces of promoting homosexuality flood social media. According to an audio recording assessed by AFP, Annette Anita Among told a prayer meeting on Tuesday that tomorrow we are going to bring a bill for anti-homosexuality. Among, Among also posted a video clip of the meeting on her Twitter account, writing, We shall jealously protect our cherished values and culture. Western governments and aid agencies working in Uganda are routinely accused of promoting homosexuality in the East African nation and have repeatedly defended the LGBTQ community from attacks related to their identity. In recent weeks, online conspiracy theories conflating child sexual abuse at boarding schools with consensual same-sex acts between adults have reached fever pitch. Uganda's government last month set up a committee to investigate the alleged promotion of gay, lesbian and transgender rights in schools. 
Science in Five follows after the break. Namibia is on our grens and tells weekly the stories of Namibia that are seen or elders in the buitenland work. The program is now you to go to the new rules and more about people, their lives, talents, skills and skills and Namibia is trots the world via food sport to learn. Follow Namibia is on our grens on Network TV, NTV, OneUp2.com and Republicans of Facebook Plot. Namen we zo naar grenzen handel oor, uitreik, gesels, reis en wenke en soms toer ons na besiens waardighere in die land waar ons kyk. Kontak grenzen at synergy.com.ni en vertel ons van Namen we eers wat jy oorsee ken of om jou reisproducten te adverteer. Namen we eers naar grenzen, ons land oorhal in die wereld. Now, as we enter the fourth year of the pandemic, what do we know about Omicron so far? Are there settings where you're more at risk? What does it mean to live with COVID-19? Well, Dr. Maria van Kirchhoff explains in Science in Five. We are entering the fourth year of the pandemic. What do we know so far about Omicron? Are there settings where people are more at risk? And what does the future look like? Hello and welcome to Science in Five. I'm Vismita Gupta-Smith. We are talking to Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove today. Welcome, Maria. Maria, let's start with what do we know so far about Omicron? Hi, Vismita. Thanks for having me back on Science in Five. Omicron is the latest variant of concern that has been in circulation around the globe for more than a year now. The virus continues to evolve and Omicron continues to evolve. There are more than 500 sublineages of Omicron that are currently in circulation. Most of these are the BA.5 sublineages. And we have a global group of individuals around the world that are helping us to track this virus. What we look at is transmissibility, and all of the Omicron sublineages are more transmissible than the next. This is what these viruses do. They need to infect individuals. But we also look at severity. And what we do know about Omicron in terms of its severity is that there's a similar level of severity of all of these sublineages. On average, Omicron was less severe than Delta, but Omicron causes the full spectrum of disease, everything from asymptomatic infection or reinfection, as well as severe disease and death. So it's really critical that we do all we can to prevent those deaths from occurring. And we're also looking at the impact of our interventions, our diagnostics, our, our therapeutics, and our vaccines. And they are holding up very well in terms of our ability to detect this virus around the world. And our vaccines are working incredibly well at preventing severe disease and death. But it is absolutely critical that surveillance is maintained around the world so that we can track the known sublineages and be able to detect any new variants of concern that may arise because there still is a risk for further variants of concern to emerge. Maria, as governments and individuals seem to be dropping precautionary measures, tell us about settings where people may be more at risk and what we can do to protect ourselves. So this is a really critical time right now. As you said, we've entered the fourth year of this pandemic and people are tired of talking about COVID and dealing with this. But I think what's really important to remember is that there's so much that we can do to reduce the spread, not stop the spread, but reduce it and also save lives right now. It's about the fundamentals. Um, there are riskier locations than others. Indoor is riskier than outdoors. Crowded settings are riskier than less crowded settings, for example. But what we need to be able to do is use the tools that exist while we live our lives. Putting on a mask when you're indoors, when you're around others, is a rational thing to do. And it's available now because masks are widely available. Making sure that governments invest in ventilation, where we live, where we work, where we study, this remains fundamental for respiratory diseases and will help improve and reduce transmission around the world. One of the critical things that you can do as an individual is get vaccinated. 
When we think about vaccination, we have to also consider that 30% of the world has not yet received a single dose. And in every country, we are missing really key individuals. We have not reached the targets of vaccination of 70% in every country. At the present time, each week between eight and 10,000 people are dying from COVID-19. And a lot of these are preventable. Maria, paint us a picture of what the future looks like. What does it mean when we say living with COVID-19? COVID-19 is here with us to stay. And what we hope is in 2023 that we can end the emergency everywhere. We are in a much better position to do that because we know so much more about this virus. Although we don't know everything and we remain humble to learning about this, we have so many tools that can reduce the spread and can save lives now. You as an individual have a role to play, knowing what your risk is where you live and taking measures while you live your life to reduce your exposure to the virus. Making sure that you get vaccinated um, and receive those full doses can prevent you from getting severe disease and dying. We have to remember that we're in entering the fourth year of this pandemic. And COVID-19 is one of the many challenges that we face. We face other infectious hazards like influenza and RSV and other circulating pathogens. But there are many other crises that we are dealing with, with climate change and floods, um, droughts, war. And so we have to manage, we have to live with COVID responsibly and manage this disease in the context of everything else. We at WHO are working very hard with all member states to integrate COVID into strengthened surveillance systems and to strengthen disease control programs so that they're not standalone programs, but that they are dealt with within strengthened health systems. Remember, we're all fragile after four years of this, entering our fourth year of this. And it's important that we be kind to one another, we listen to one another, we help each other through this because we can end this emergency everywhere in 2023. Thank you, Maria. That was Science in 5 today. Until next time then, stay safe, stay healthy, and stick with science. In economic news this morning, Uganda and South Africa leaders urge greater trade in Africa. Ugandan President Yoweri Museveni has called for a stronger trade relations among African countries and lamented the high cost of buying products and services outside the continent. Museveni said on Tuesday uh, he began a state visit to South Africa in a bid to encourage better economic ties between Uganda and and South Africa's most developed economy. Tanzania firm signs mining supply deal with Elon Musk's Tesla. Tesla, the American multinational automotive artificial intelligence and clean energy company, has signed an agreement under which it will purchase anode active material from Tanzania. And AAM is the active material in negative electrodes. This comes after Tesla signed a deal with a vertically integrated lithium ion battery company, Magnus Energy Technologies Limited, and its Tanzanian subsidiaries, Uranex Tanzania Limited, and Magnus Technologies Tanzania Limited. Magnus Magnus Energy Technologies Limited, which is listed on the Australian Securities Exchange, owns Uranix and MTT by 100%. Here are the economic indicators. We'll now be getting into the sports news with Ari Hohad and right after we take a look at the weather predictions. So starting off with tennis news on the men's tour, on the ATP tour, it is uh, the Dubai Duty Free Championship taking place. It's uh, lots, many of the top players in men's tennis playing in this tournament. It's an ATP 500 tournament.
Number one seed, Novak Djokovic, he's back in action again after winning the Australian Open and uh, he beat uh, Thomas Mahaj of the Czech Republic. Actually a tight game, a very difficult game for Novak Djokovic in his first round. He won 6-3, 3-6 and then 7-6 in the tiebreak in the third set. Is Mahaj, he is number 130th in the world, but a great performance by him against the world number one. Also world number three, Daniel Medvedev, he played against Matteo Arnaldi of Italy, a, a easy win for Medvedev, he's through winning 6-4, 6-2, that is to the round of 16. Also number four seed, Philippe Aguirre Alissimo, he's from Canada, he beat Maxime Chessy of the USA and the score there was 7-6, 3-6 and 6-3, the winner there, Alissimo from Canada. Next for Novak Djokovic will be in the round of 16, he will play Talon Griekspoor, uh, Griekspoor is from the Netherlands and it is Novak Djokovic uh, back uh, after the Australian Open, he was out for quite a few weeks because of a hamstring injury, uh, didn't do too well against Mahash, uh, he was a bit rusty but now he can play in the round of 16 against Griekspoor of the Netherlands. Moving on to some soccer news, um, it's FA Cup fifth round action that's completed and uh, it was a big uh, result for Blackburn Rovers. Uh, Blackburn Rovers playing in the Championship League for quite a few years now. Uh, used to play quite a few years in the Premier League, uh, but uh, it's uh, Blackburn Rovers that beat Leicester City. They of course a Premier League team. They beat them 2-1 and that game was actually at King Power Stadium, the home team, home ground of Leicester City. So great result for Blackburn Rovers through to the next round of the FA Cup. More fifth round action, Manchester City, they beat Bristol City, that game was away, that was at Bristol City, it was a 3-0 win for Manchester City and then Fulham, they beat Leeds at home by two goals to nil. And that brings us to the end of our show. But before we say goodbye, let's take a look at the highlights from today's broadcast, just in case you need a quick recap. In Sierra Leone, the people fighting the sea to build a home. Nigeria's Bola Tinubu declared winner of presidential vote. Militants kidnapped 25 youths in northern DR Congo. Uganda and South African leaders urge greater trade in Africa. Those have been our stories. We thank you very much for watching our show this morning. Please be reminded that we welcome your remarks regarding our show. You can post them on our Twitter and Facebook pages. This particular show is on DSTV channel 285 as well as Go TV channel 94. And on that note, it is all our love and all our light. Happy Thursday.